There will be time for questions, uh, and I'm sure there will be afterwards. We turn now to Professor Stephen Mason, a fellow Canadian, Canadian historian of Judea in the Greco-Roman period, best known for his studies in Josephus and um, other early Christian writings. Uh, he is professor of classics and history. He was professor of classics and history at York University in Toronto. He has been the Kirby Lang uh, Chair in New Testament Exegesis in Aberdeen University and is currently Professor Emeritus from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And then I have his most recent uh, publications here, which are important to, for us to understand the historical context in which he's speaking. His uh, m most recent books, because there are many, many publications, but Orientation to the History of Roman Judea, 2016. Then also in 2016, A History of the Jewish War. And then finally, 2022, Josephus, Judean War, Book Four, Translation and Commentary. So we are very excited to hear you speak about the Greco-Roman historical studies in the New Testament. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, and uh, I have to say it's, uh, I'm extraordinarily fortunate to be here for a whole semester in Rome, so thank you, Father Kolarczyk and colleagues, for that. And uh, no less delighted to be able to address this international uh, audience here this afternoon. So thank you, Father Beret and colleagues, for inviting me. It's a real honor, and I have much enjoyed the presentation so far, uh, really uh, I've learned a lot, so thank you. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so you know my topic. The question I've been given is, how does the Hellenistic Roman historian use the New Testament? How does the Hellenistic Roman historian use the New Testament? The answer is that historians ought to treat New Testament texts as we do other ancient sources. This is what Thomas Jefferson already advised Peter Carr back in 1785. Read the Bible then as you would read Livy or Tacitus. The classicist theologian Benjamin Jowett insisted on the same point in 1860. The office of the interpreter, he said, is not to add another, but to recover the original meaning. That is, of the words as they first struck on the ears or flashed before the eyes of those who heard and read them. His object is to read scripture like any other book. Having said this much, I think there's enough there that we could go straight to the discussion period uh, and just say, what does this mean? But alas, you invited me to talk, and the simple prescription turned out to be rather fraught. Jefferson was reviled as an atheist in his time for saying what he said. Joet, though too eminent to dislodge from his Oxford chair, would suffer years of harassment. Much has changed in the meantime, of course. In Catholic circles, the 1993 statement of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which we've already heard about, declared Holy Scripture has been composed by human authors in all its various parts and in all the sources that lie behind them. Because of this, its proper understanding not only admits the use of this historical critical method, but actually requires it. Historical study of the New Testament has by now been fully integrated with other kinds. To take just one famous instance, the exemplary studies of the birth and death of Jesus by the late Sulpician father, Raymond Brown. We have come a long way. And yet, there remains something distinct and even alien for ancient historians who stumble into the New Testament world and its research environment. So I invite you to think about this with me under two sub-questions. First, what does it mean to read any texts historically? And second, what are the prospects and sticking points in doing this with the New Testament? Who put that in there? Uh, if much of my talk covers familiar ground, please do not take offense. It's not that I think it's unfamiliar to you, but rather I'm returning to first principles for the sake of clarity. Now, lacking the time to defend a definition of history, I borrow one from R.G. Collingwood that I find agreeable. 
History is the kind of research or inquiry that attempts to answer questions about human actions in the past. It proceeds by the interpretation of evidence. Its ultimate aim is knowledge of what it means to be human, self-knowledge. Undergirding this definition, and often overlooked, is the premise that we cannot begin to know what happened in the past unless we inquire, unless we investigate. Historians are not judges passing verdicts on stories that reach us ready-made, but investigators. Nearly everything that ancient civilizations once produced is now lost. Their texts, built structures, and material elements of life. When we find a survival, therefore, it would be absurd to pronounce it reliable or the opposite. History's unique offer is that when it comes to the human past, we can know only what we have investigated. But how can investigation generate knowledge of the distant past? To answer this thorny question, 19th century academic history forked into two currents. Many came to think that only the study of humanity in the aggregate over long spans and seeking patterns, laws, and relations could yield a kind of knowledge that would put history on a level with the sciences. We should study human beings, they proposed, as we do other fauna and flora. Individual aberration is just that. Crane Brinton's 1938 Anatomy of Revolution, for example, holds that national revolts of different times and places followed a pattern that had nothing to do with individual choice. Will and Ariel Durant's Lessons of History is a more curious example in the same vein. The other stream broke in the opposite direction. Scholars there argued that knowledge worthy of the name requires precise attention to details. They held that momentous decisions of the past were obviously situational and personal and often excruciating and not the predictable product of impersonal forces. This kind of history did not aspire to teach lessons. At home in the Geisteswissenschaften, it was rather interested in the possibilities of the human spirit in unrepeatable situations. Investigating the origins of a revolt from this perspective, one would scrutinize the different choices made by individuals of similar class and background. Whereas social scientific history doubted that the humanist kind rose to the level of science, humanist historians charged those colleagues with ransacking sources as though they provided representative data, as you could get in the modern world through surveys and interviews. This bypassed the step that humanists thought indispensable, namely interpretation. Now, New Testament research has always embraced the humanist stream of history, the quest of the historical Jesus, the careers of Paul and his opponents, the synoptic problem, the study of each gospel and acts, are all questions of particulars, individuals, and moments in the past. Impersonal studies of the Galilean and Judean economies social conditions, families, the purported realities of Roman imperialism are certainly growing in number and influence, but I confine the rest of my remarks to the more established humanist trajectory. Now, doing history in this way requires the investigator to make a challenging leap from one mentality to its opposite, namely from trust to radical doubt. How so? Well, I mentioned the humanists need first to interpret. Once we have defined a problem and identified the relevant sources, our first task is to understand them contextually, whether they are text, coins, inscriptions, or building remains. Interpreting an artifact requires us to jump with both feet into the world of its creators and consumers. First, to borrow from Fernando Saussure, to understand any particular act of speech, a parole, we need some grasp of the sheer discourse that any author needs to communicate the common lang of the time. Second, we study the particular creation. We cannot understand a letter from Cicero, Pliny, or Paul, or a coin or inscription, without imagining ourselves among its first recipients. This requires the suspension of disbelief. We follow the author's cues for basic meaning, but also to detect nuances of rhetorical artifice, irony, 
possibly sarcasm. If an author scolds an adversary, for example, he expects an audience that will enjoy the put down and not object. This interpretative phase can be and most often is conducted outside of any other investigation. Multi-volume catalogs of coins, inscriptions, and papyri join textual commentaries to furnish preliminary interpretations of the known survivals for general use. Whether we then accept these or produce new interpretations after closer study, some understanding of each artifact is a prerequisite for the historian's second task, which is to reconstruct in our imaginations the lost past that produce the evidence. This requires us to change hats and embrace radical doubt of the very sources we were just trying to interpret. We must move on to hypothetical reconstruction because, again, so little has survived. And now that we better understand the limitations of what has survived, we see that it could never settle ready-made the problem we have chosen to investigate. A century ago, Collingwood reflected on the difficulty this can create for historians. He said, it is shocking to face the fact that the writers whom one has regarded as authoritative are completely misapprehending the events which they describe. Yet, this opinion is really the most precious possession of historical thought. It is a working hypothesis without which no historian can move a single step. Now, although he was not speaking of New Testament matters, Collingwood here put his finger on the issue that long placed a barrier between history and theology. New Testament scholars generally welcome the interpretative phase of historical investigation as consonant with exegesis. They divided, however, over the move from trust to doubt. When scholars from Rimaris through D.F. Strauss replaced traditional pictures of Christ with what seemed to them rational alternatives, or F.C. Bauer found in the few letters of Paul he deemed genuine, evidence of deep conflict already in the apostolic period, sparks flew. The tension came to a head in the 19th century, at the end of which Martin Kaler spoke of the chasm that had opened between what he disparagingly called the so-called historical Jesus and the biblical Christ. To some, history and theology seemed irreconcilable, making conflicting claims about the same events. Paradoxically, however, the archeological discoveries of the 19th century, which initially supercharged historians' confidence, gradually had the opposite effect. For with each new find, scholars were aware of how much more had been lost. It was hazardous to build a new picture on a recent find, which might be upended by the next year's discoveries. The growing acceptance of how little we could know historically was paralleled by developments in the sciences at the same time. And the First World War famously exploded any lingering illusions of progress toward rational explanation. By the 1920s, at any rate, most historians had moved from confidence in conclusions to a preoccupation with method. Indeed, the other extreme of not moving beyond questions and doubts has become respectable. Bloch and Collingwood already knew before the Second World War colleagues who found at least pre-modern history logically indefensible, as Voltaire had. But they advocated carrying on for reasons that most working historians have supported. Simply, it's worth trying to understand the human past without pretensions to certainty. The very process of learning the languages and ways of the ancients and imagining how events might have happened exposes us to the possibilities of human experience, which is the point. The journey is itself a worthy destination. As Bloch put it more eloquently, the incomplete, if it is perpetually straining to realize itself, is quite as enticing as the most perfect success. And the sight of an investigation with its successes and reverses is seldom boring. It is the ready-made article, which is cold and dull. Now, this very basic uh, review, I apologize if it's too basic, um, is necessary to help explain how I see the possibilities of New Testament research from a historical standpoint. But before going further, I must address the elephant in the piazza, which is, what does history do with miracles? 
In our therapeutic times, the question is considered ill-mannered. Though not so long ago, it caused open warfare. My view is simply that miracle is not a historical question. Because it explores past human experience, history seeks the simplest explanations of evidence. If the first century historian Josephus reports that three million Jerusalemites heard a speech, we both try to understand what he's doing in trying to impress his audiences with grossly inflated numbers, and we doubt the claim because it's physically impossible. If other texts relate that donkeys spoke or statues cried, we again try to understand the nature of each text, even as we doubt the claims. That is because, simply, misperception and embellishment of stories are part of our daily experience even now, as certainly when we study ancient texts. So it will always be simpler to attribute extraordinary claims to those causes, those common life experiences. But this is another way of saying that history cannot deal with the truly unique or extraordinary, because even if it did happen, it would still be historically improbable. What historians can do is trace the development of a miracle story in our evidence, and this is not nothing. It can be highly illuminating. The kind of historical doubt that matters for New Testament studies is not about miracle, therefore, but it concerns trust in our sources and in our own hypotheses. Let me illustrate with an example from an adjacent field. Josephus claims that Judea hosted three philosophical schools, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. If we took him as an authority, we would accept this as a fact. And it has proved an irresistible temptation to connect every Judean text in person from John the Baptist and Jesus to scrolls from Qumran with one of these schools. Historical method, however, requires us, requires us to doubt Josephus. This does not mean, it does not mean disparaging him or ridiculing him. On the contrary, we first try to understand what he's saying. This is interpretation. He had a taste for the rule of three, for example, tending to describe everything in triads. Moreover, he compares his Judean schools with Greek counterparts, uh, Stoics, Epicureans, and Pythagoreans. Taking such considerations on board forces us to look beyond Josephus if we want to understand the real life landscape. If we ask independently whether others in pre-70 Judea knew about three schools, we see that this hypothesis fails to explain the evidence. Paul, Q, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, uh, Philo, Pliny the Elder, and the early rabbis all describe one or more of these three. And not only do they fail to mention any triad, but it would be hard to understand what they do say if they'd known of such a reality. So doubt is a normal and necessary part of historical thinking and nothing to fear if we are once willing to study New Testament texts historically. Now against this background to the second part, how does New Testament research look to an ancient historian? On the one hand, vigorous applications of historical thinking abound in the discipline. I was surprised to see Collingwood, whom I'm referring to often, back in 1926, telling his Oxford students, the average professional historian is far less critical in his attitude to Herodotus than the average professional theologian in his attitude to St. Mark. Now that's a statement to ponder. Biblical and New Testament studies had long hosted pioneers in historical criticism, really pushing to the edge. Their application of sharp criteria could border on hypercriticism, one might say. All that is now old rope in New Testament studies. On the other hand, some tendencies in New Testament research, even today, look peculiar from a historical perspective. I'm not suggesting that these can or should change, but the implications are worth considering. To begin with, the very structure of the New Testament canon is inconvenient for history. The canonical arrangement has a logic, of course, ordering texts from the life of Jesus to the book of Revelation, but this preempts the historical principle of arranging texts by order of composition, which is the only way that allows us to see change, action, and reaction. The canonical structure makes it hard for students to grasp that Paul's letters came first that they are the only primary sources for the post-Easter generation, the only ones generally accepted. 
that the later Gospels are informed by the differences those letters reflect, that Matthew and Luke both respond to the earliest known narrative, Mark, ex hypothesis, and that Luke acts as a two-volume work, all of these being rather basic points for historical thinking. And partly because the canon arranges Paul's letters by length, Romans has always dominated the interpretation of Paul, even though it is the least characteristic of his letters. First Thessalonians looks to be the earliest surviving letter by Paul, but it sits obscurely near the back of the New Testament. Historical method would require us to begin with it. Another thing that strikes, sorry, I'm not keeping up with the slides here. That's a more historical picture, and uh, those are the uh, things I just mentioned being obscured. Another thing that strikes an ancient historian about the New Testament ecosystem is a peculiarity of lingo, not only in translations, but in the conceptions they assume. I mentioned before the need to get to grips with ancient lang. Most ancient historians take considerable effort in this respect. With the New Testament, by contrast, church terminology that took shape in later periods has become embedded in many key terms. This is understandable for liturgical use, no question, but it may hinder us from hearing what the authors meant to say to audiences who were unfamiliar with that later usage. Famous examples include ecclesia, normally assembly rather than church, apostolos and angelos, normally envoy or messenger rather than apostle or angel, and bapto words, which indicate washing or immersion rather than baptism. Likewise, mathetes looks closer to student than to disciple, whereas zelotes is closer to disciple than to zealot, which has bad vibes from the later influence of Josephus on Western tradition. The singular euangelion, which Paul uses frequently but is unattested earlier, looks like the news report or the announcement rather than the gospel, a translation that may blur the distinctiveness that Paul intended. This is not to say that common usage preempts innovation. On the contrary, it is also good history to recognize difference among diverse communities and to allow that a creative author such as Paul could give special meaning to words, of course. After all, Plato gave ideas, uh, meaning unknown to anybody else, and philosophical schools use terms in peculiar ways. In Paul's case, likewise, the common meanings of hamartia, soteria, and doxa as failure, preservation, or rescue, and opinion or appearance would not always work. When he personifies hamartia as a power, sin may be the most suitable term. Still, we recognize uh, these distinctive traits by the interplay between what is common in the Lang and the given author's cues. And here we may wonder whether New Testament research capitulates too readily to tradition. It matters historically whether Jesus' companion, Simon the Zelotes, was a zealot, member of a party that began in 66 CE, or was known as particularly eager and devoted, perhaps as the fourth gospel calls only one person, the, the student whom Jesus loved. In other cases, the imposition of modern decorum on New Testament language may sap not only vigor, but also some of the intended meaning. For example, when Paul divides his mission world between, excuse me here now, but the foreskin, the acrobustia, and the cutting off, or the peritome, he's using extraordinarily vivid language, unsuited to polite conversation then as now. In Philippians 3, he equates a peritome with catatome, mutilation, or cutting up. The same passage declares his past achievements as a Judean mere droppings or excrement, scubula, which he left behind to know Christ and await the Savior's return from heaven, where exists the only political community, politeuma, he cares about. The Latin Vulgate still renders Paul's Greek surprisingly vividly. Most modern translations, however, I think all of them, absorb the shock. So the foreskin becomes the more banal, uncircumcised, and excrement mere rubbish. This is undoubtedly better for church reading. I have no doubt about that. 
But does it obscure some of Paul's point? What if his opponents were calling for the removal of foreskins, which we happen to know, uh, to follow Christ, and an exasperated Paul up the rhetorical ante by deliberately addressing his tempted followers as the foreskin, a kind of locker room reductio ad absurdum. However that may be, Paul's foreskin circumcision distinction reveals also his tendency to address males alone, as though, uh, even though we know that women were present in his communities. This does not shock historians, for ancient authors normally assume male audiences. New Testament writers shared that world, limiting the sphere of women's activities and decorum. Likewise, the main speakers in Acts address audiences as brothers, brothers and fathers, or men and brothers. Recent New Testament translations convert all this to brothers and sisters, of course. We get that, we get it, again with modern church reading in mind, but does it come at some cost to understanding the different norms of the ancient world? 1 Corinthians 7.36 following is a striking case. There Paul discusses whether, in view of the imminence of Christ's return, a man should give in marriage, gamizo, his virgin, who has re- his virgin who has reached sexual maturity or retain her under his authority. That choice is unsurprising in ancient contexts where a daughter was her father's to keep or to give in marriage, usually at age 13 or so. It's quite different from the case Paul has already mentioned in 7, 8 to 9 concerning older singles, including widows, who may decide to marry of their free will. Recent translations of the later passage, however, create a quasi-modern scenario in which a male fiancé decides whether his passions are no longer bearable and so he must take the virgin. The translator's goal is surely to make the passage meaningful for modern situations and readers, and I have no interest in criticizing that. But it is difficult to see how the posited situation would work in relation to either the Greek words or the ancient conditions. Perhaps the most consequential linguistic oddity concerns cherished categories in scholarship. In the humanist stream, abstract nouns that were not part of the ancient line tend to give historians nervous ticks. Atheism, ethnicity, religion, as was discussed, identity, imperialism, colonialism, Discussing these would be like asking about ancient health care, banking, or penitentiary systems. And although the ancients wrote about Egyptians, Romans, and Athenians, they did not speak of Egyptism, Romism, or Athenism. Philosophical schools get a bit of a pass here, but even Platonism and Stoicism are understood to be cheating terms when we use them. It is strange, then, that New Testament research is so deeply invested in the categories of Judaism and Christianity, which are both later church creations. Judaism, a highly prejudicial back formation of Christianism. It seems even odder that some scholars reject the term Christianity as acronistic while insisting on Judaism. Finally, a different kind of investment among New Testament scholars that might seem odd in historical terms is shared with, I think, biblical and related studies generally. And this is a morally tinged ethos that encourages the formation of camps. To be sure, history has always hosted big disagreements and ideological rifts in academic societies from modern history offer a particularly strong parallel. So this may be a difference of degree rather than kind, but having worked in both sides, it does seem to me that ancient historians still investigate Roman governance, empire, provincial administration, and texts, as we see in the Bryn Mawr Classical Review, for example, in a way that pretty much welcomes all contributions and challenges, no matter how fundamental. They're debated, but everybody's talking. In biblical and related studies, and this is especially noticeable in large conference gatherings, not this one, it is striking how many groups define themselves by their perspective and cut themselves off. Unit names appear to invite those of like perspective while excluding others, even if not consciously. Now, there's no reason to doubt the sincerity of such groups' leaders. I'm not criticizing the phenomenon, just observing it. I'm asking whether, as in ancient history, the main goal is to explore what happened 
or rather to find support for current values. Ancient historians most often emphasize how different, weird, bizarre the ancient world was, the Roman world in particular. This feels different. Other kinds of presentism appear when the European SNTS opens each conference day's proceedings with optional prayers, but they're in the program. Or when the much larger society of biblical literature requires its members to confess a creed of core values, as they call, call them, which are modern and progressive before using the society website. You cannot use the SPL website unless you say, okay, I got it. The New Testament has always been co-opted in support of present day virtues, but the problem is these virtues manifestly change from one generation to the next. I have not registered such a moral mission among ancient historians, I conclude. In his 1949 inaugural lecture, uh, the literary critic David Cecil pushed against the presentisms of his day, saying that to understand texts from the past, one needed to travel mentally to their world. We must learn the language of the past. Past periods are like foreign countries, regions inhabited by men of like passions to our own, but with different customs and codes of behavior. If we do not know these, we shall misunderstand their actions and misapprehend their motives. He was actually talking about Jane Austen here. Uh, Cecil's inclusive use of men, even when he's talking about Jay, Jay, uh, Austen, Jane Austen, uh, which looks odd or outrageous in 2023, strengthens the point. He could say that in 1949 and people would understand what he meant. The upshot of my talk is that although in many respects New Testament research has obviously embraced historical thinking, it is not always clear that the motive is to understand the ancient past and a different way of being as we would if we were studying ancient China or India. Since graduate school, I've argued that in public universities, New Testament research should be integrated with the study of classical history and literature. Asking new questions of the earliest Christian text that this would encourage uh, might open doors to better understanding of the first century, the Rome's empire from the periphery, rhetoric, historiography, questions of genre, for starters. But the two disciplines continue to occupy separate silos. New Testament research often borrowing from ancient history, but rarely influencing it. It is understandable that New Testament readers would like to see the founders as sharing their present day outlooks, but if they did, it would be difficult to explain the intervening 2000 years. This reflection prompts us to question my opening proposition or to return to it. Can or should the New Testament be read as we read other ancient texts? If not, what does it mean to study these texts historically? Thank you.